Hello, I'm Laura Douglas, President of Bristol Community College, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you today to the National Offshore Wind Institute's Speaker Series. This spring, President Biden announced his commitment for clean energy and the development of the offshore wind industry, setting his goal for the deployment of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. This inspirational goal will create tens of thousands of good paying jobs with more than 44,000 workers employed in offshore wind by 2030 and nearly 33,000 additional jobs in communities supported by offshore wind activity. It will also generate enough power to meet the demand of more than 10 million American homes for a year and avoid 78 million metric tons of CO2 emissions. For the last decade, Bristol Community College has focused on offshore wind, creating the first offshore wind technician associate degree program and certificate, as well as examining the infrastructure needs through the generation of a 2018 Massachusetts Offshore Wind Workforce Assessment funded by the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. From this work, Bristol created the National Offshore Wind Institute, or NAWI, to provide strategies to accelerate and support the next generation of workforce and supply chain for the wind energy sector. Bristol's NAWI is a state-of-the-art facility on the waterfront of New Bedford that will provide robust workforce and training programs. The NAWI will offer a comprehensive array of required training to ensure the local and regional workforce has the skills, competencies, and certifications required for careers in offshore wind industry. Specifically, the NAWI will offer the Global Wind Organization, or GWO, trainings, including basic safety and basic technical training modules that are required for all workers certified to be employed on an offshore wind farm. The NAWI will offer the full array of GWO training programs, other required accreditations, skill development for the workforce pipeline, as well as customized private sector training for the developers, OEMs, and supply chain companies. Today, as part of the launch of NAWI's speaker series, we will explore the career pathways into the industry with an important focus on equity. Bristol is ensuring our students and the campus community that we support equity in educational and career pathways, as well as act as the voice to the region and state promoting access for underserved populations. Thank you for joining us to learn more about this exciting emerging industry and how it will change the world. Now we are joined by Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, Kathleen Theoretis, to hear about the current status of the industry. Good morning. Thank you, President Douglas, for the introduction. It's wonderful to speak with you all today during a period of true momentum for offshore wind and climate action here in Massachusetts and in the United States. Quite simply, after some years of uncertainty, offshore wind has really been on a roll lately. Just two weeks ago, I traveled down to New Bedford Commerce Terminal to mark yet another significant milestone for Vineyard Wind, this emerging industry and the workers that will chart a new course for clean energy right off our shores. I was so pleased to join so many federal, state, and local officials, as well as supporters of this industry, including President Douglas, to celebrate Vineyard Wind, the Southeastern Massachusetts Building Trades Council, and the more than 20 trade unions throughout the South Coast, Cape and Islands that joined together to sign a historic project labor agreement, the first such agreement for offshore wind in the US. It would be impossible to overstate just how critical this project and this industry is to the future of the Commonwealth. This past March, Governor Baker signed nation-leading climate legislation that gave Massachusetts the most ambitious goals to reduce emissions in the entire country, enshrining our target of net zero emissions by 2050 into law. Before signing that legislation, our administration engaged in two years of planning and analysis 
culminating in our 2050 deep decarbonization roadmap to establish the pathways for the work we need to do to meet our climate goals over the next 30 years. And though the task at hand is immense, the pathway is very clear, and we know part of the solution is rapidly deploying new clean energy at a massive scale. Offshore wind represents the single greatest opportunity we have here in Massachusetts to take on climate change and meet those ambitious goals. And we are going to need a lot of this resource, as much as 15 to 20 gigawatts over the next 30 years to meet the needs of our residents and businesses. The success of this first vineyard wind project is a huge part of our offshore wind strategy to prove we can build this industry here in the US and to put us on the path for many more projects like this over the next 30 years. By launching this first project and laying the groundwork for many projects to come and proving out the low cost of offshore wind, we have a generational opportunity in Massachusetts to create new jobs and economic opportunities, especially in our South Coast region and historic port cities like New Bedford. For the first two Massachusetts projects, Vineyard Wind and Mayflower Wind alone, it is estimated that the 1600 megawatts of power will support between 2,000 and 3,000 direct job years over the next 10 years and generate direct economic impact in Massachusetts of between 675 and $800 million. The Baker Polito administration is focused on making sure Massachusetts workers are leading the way on this new frontier. That's why we've made early investments in programs and infrastructure to lead the way on offshore wind. In the past two years, the Baker Polito administration has worked with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and the offshore wind developers to invest more than $2.2 million in grants to support offshore wind training programs across the Commonwealth. And just last week, we announced another $1.6 million in grant funding to make sure that we're developing this new clean energy workforce and focusing on bringing all of our residents along giving everyone an opportunity to succeed and ensuring that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a central focus of this effort. Through this funding, eight Massachusetts organizations, including Bristol Community College's National Offshore Wind Institute, will develop programs to reduce barriers to job entry within the emerging offshore wind industry. The PLA signing and these new workforce programs are both major elements of this workforce network. The PLA agreement will create more than 650 union jobs in Massachusetts, ranging from turbine assembly and construction onshore to longshoremen and other maritime activities offshore. We're very pleased to see that the agreement also mandates that a majority of the workforce come from local labor, specifically Bristol, Plymouth, Barnstable, and Dukes counties, in addition to ambitious hiring targets for women and people of color. And the grants awarded through Massachusetts Clean Energy Center's Expanding Access to Opportunity Program will build on the Baker Polito Administration's commitment to support the development of a highly skilled offshore wind workforce that reflects the people of Massachusetts, addresses barriers to opportunity, and builds pathways to grow a diverse, equity, equitable, and inclusive workforce. But to truly maximize the economic development and job creation opportunities offered by the offshore wind industry, the Commonwealth will support the development of specialized port infrastructure and a robust supply chain. Massachusetts has led the way in offshore wind port development with early investments in the New Bedford Marine Commerce Terminal, currently the only special purpose facility designed to support the staging of turbine components and other elements of the construction and installation of offshore wind projects. But we know that for this industry to meet its full potential in Massachusetts and the US market, it will need far more port infrastructure to respond to the needs of states up and down the East Coast as we decarbonize. That's why Governor Baker has filed a plan to put direct federal COVID relief funding to immediate use in cities and towns across the Commonwealth including a significant investment in marine port infrastructure upgrades for offshore wind, accelerating short-term and long-term economic development in the Commonwealth. The administration's proposal would direct $100 million of ARPA funding to support marine port infrastructure and the deployment, construction, operation, and maintenance of offshore wind. 
This funding can be used to rehabilitate or expand port areas like New Bedford, helping us meet our clean energy and climate goals while also revitalizing our port areas and cities, creating jobs and supporting other important local industries. Offshore wind provides a historic opportunity for the Commonwealth to achieve its ambitious climate goals while creating local jobs and economic opportunity, and the Baker Polito administration is committed to working with local institutions like BCC to support the development of this burgeoning industry. There is simply a tremendous opportunity in front of us all, but especially for the workers that are going to build this project and trailblaze this new clean energy future. And by working together, building partnerships and leveraging our educational institutions like BCC and the National Offshore Wind Institute, we can make sure that all people across the Commonwealth can find a pathway into this new industry and that we build a diverse, inclusive workforce that truly reflects the people of Massachusetts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Secretary Theoretes. Now we turn to five dynamic leaders from the offshore wind industry that represent five critical industry organizations. GE, Siemens Gamesa, Vestas, Vineyard Wind, and Mayflower Wind, with their own experiences that brought them to their current career and position in offshore wind today. Growing up in Illinois, in the suburbs, I always asked how do things work? I probably irritated my parents consistently. I would ask, well, how does the water get from Lake Michigan to our house? My parents would try to give me an explanation or they'd say, you know, maybe to go look it up. I didn't learn about engineering until I was about to be a senior in high school. I did my bachelor's in mechanical engineering completed my master's and my PhD in aerospace engineering. Then I was interested in getting hands-on and see the human element of training itself. And I currently run our Siemens Gamesa training facility in Orlando. My position entails being responsible for training our technicians. And that includes safety training. So from a basic level, such as working at heights, first aid, all the way through the more advanced level where we teach technicians how to properly maintain the wind turbines. We're working on a project with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center to add virtual reality training to some of our global standards. One of the big challenges is how do we get so many people trained for all the new jobs? This is where virtual reality can be an asset that's really cool and exciting. It's very interesting to me as I think about the male-dominated environment. You also don't see many minorities. I've been glad to see that Siemens Gamesa is a company that has several diversity, equity, inclusion programs. I also see the leaders that where I work for being very supportive for women, especially to apply for positions. We've looked at partnering with community colleges, Bristol Community College being one of them. I really think it's important to reach out to people at a younger age to actually let them understand and see what this field is all about, how exciting it can be. Anything you think of, there are opportunities in WIND, from finance to logistics to quality to health and safety to engineering design. Most people did not get to where they are on their own. One of the key things as women is we need to be confident and reach out so if you're maybe not quite sure if you have the experience or the background look into it reach out to somebody it may just be little insights and conversations and it may be them reaching down and helping show you the way in a more detailed manner if you're sincere and you've done your research they'll take the time to talk to you and explain more my name is Cynthia Brown head of training for Service Americas at Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. I'm Beth Clark. I'm with GE Renewable Energy, and I'm responsible for the supply chain for offshore wind in North America. As a kid, we were leaving a fair, and I had a red balloon, and I accidentally let it go. And I started sobbing, and my mom was like, it's just a balloon, we'll get you another one. And I was worried that it was gonna pop, get stuck in a whale's blowhole, and kill a whale. 
So I first wanted to save the whales, then the rainforest, then figure out how to fix the hole in the ozone. And I went and I got my degree in environmental studies with a concentration in public policy and got incredibly fortunate after college to join GE in their onshore wind business. I've been with GE for over 11 years. When I was thinking about joining GE, it did not enter my mind that I was going into a predominantly male industry. When I talked to the folks who were doing this role and heard how excited they were and the type of work that they were doing, all I knew is that's where I wanted to be. I've got to do all sorts of things, from project management to supply chain, everything from commercial to services. I had the opportunity to go to Germany and train people to do the job. There is great potential in offshore wind and a very lofty target of 30 gigawatts by 2030. And so when you just think about making that happen, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. It's one of the things I like when there's nothing, you figure out how to go build it and make it become a reality. I think probably one of the most pivotal mentors was the first person I worked for who saw potential in me and very early on said, okay, fine, these are your projects. You're going to do this. I'm part of the African American Forum leadership and that is GE's oldest employee resource group. GE's groups, they're incredible. There's a Women's Network, the Veterans Network, Hispanic Forum, GE's Pride Alliance. The AAF, we do recruiting at college campuses, and then there are internship programs. I think what Bristol Community College is trying to do in creating pathways and showing talent potential opportunity is like really connecting dots. This is a great opportunity to be in this space at this time. I feel like if someone came to me and said, Beth, should I, shouldn't I get involved in offshore or renewable? I would wanna know what, what lights a person up, right? If they like being part of a team, what type of challenges they like. And if you think it could be in renewable energy, pursue it. Get on LinkedIn, find people, go ahead, send me a message. I think the other thing that I would wanna say is don't select yourself out of something that you're interested in. My whole career has been a lot of zigging and zagging, and sometimes, you know, it's in the detour that you find your way. If you can get clear for yourself about what lights you up and use that as your kind of guiding star, go for it. Julia Ren Jackson, and I am an offshore permitting analyst for Mayflower Wind. I'm from Andover, Massachusetts, so I've spent a lot of time in Boston by the water and also on Cape Cod. I had always loved anything to do with the ocean. If anybody asked me what superpower I wanted, I would always say I wish I could breathe underwater. I did go scuba diving a few years ago for the first time, and it was better than I could have imagined. Before coming to Mayflower, I studied environmental engineering. I always thought that I would go into something STEM related, but I did always have this expectation that at some point in my career, I would probably be in a field that was mostly dominated by males. I wasn't necessarily thrilled by it, but I wasn't gonna let it stop me, go into whatever I had wanted to do. I also realized that renewable energy was something I was interested in. I focus specifically on federal permits. What I found when I got into this role was that it is policy, but it's also very environmentally focused. Over the past year, we have been working on Mayflower's construction and operations plan. It's essentially a blueprint for the entire project. Because it's such an all-encompassing document, I've gotten to work with many different teams across Mayflower. It's been cool to learn about what every part of the project is like. I was surprised to find that the permitting team at Mayflower is mostly made up of women. From the analysts, to the managers, to the director, they told me their stories and they provided advice. It just made me feel so much more comfortable in my situation and I thought, if they can do it and look where they are now, I can do it. 
I love seeing people get excited about offshore wind because a lot of people don't really know much about it. So Mayflower is working with local educational institutions, including the National Offshore Wind Institute at Bristol Community College. Providing this exposure to a large group of young people is so valuable. I have had younger students from my college approach me and ask me questions, and I love having those conversations. The industry needs a lot of young people who are excited to work hard and improve the industry. Offshore wind is a great place for women to be right now because it is the new and emerging industry in the U.S. That means that there aren't so many barriers for women. If they are passionate about it and work hard, they can excel and forge their own path. Mayflower Wind is a joint venture between Shell and Ocean Winds. All together, these companies provide training and resources to promote diversity and equity. And Mayflower wants to make sure that all of these opportunities are available to historically disadvantaged communities. When I started at Mayflower, I knew I was going to like the topics. What I didn't know is how great the community would be. It is extremely supportive. Whether you have one month of experience or 10 years of experience, everybody's always learning. Just go for it. Jump right into the offshore wind industry because that's the best way to start learning. My name is Rachel Pachter and I am the Chief Development Officer for Vineyard Wind. I went to the University of Alaska. I got to do a lot of really cool things. I was teaching as an undergrad. I was doing field work in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. Moose everywhere and northern lights all the time. It was quite a novel experience, which I recommend to people for college. You know, take a risk. It's a time when you can see new things. It was also inexpensive because it was a state school, so that worked out well too. When I left college, I got involved in the first U.S. wind farm that was proposed, the Cape Wind Project. I started there as an intern back in early 2002, so almost 20 years ago. To me, it was kind of a no-brainer. I just jumped right in. I always say I'm a duckling being raised by elephants. I walked into a room of men who'd been in this industry for 40 years and was like, I can keep up with them and I can work with them. I think they were sort of confused by this approach. So what I did was mold my personality towards the way they approach things. That also wasn't sustainable. I was like, you know, I need to meet more senior women in the energy industry. I randomly reached out to some female mentors on LinkedIn. And when I knew I was going to a conference, I have a couple of random meetings. I've been very lucky that a number of the men that I've worked with have been interested in what that different experience is and how they could adjust for it. So I've been very lucky that I've been able to have those open conversations. We'll be building the Vineyard Wind project out of the port of New Bedford. We're investing in the community here and engaging with the schools. Vineyard Wind does have an internship program. Internships are definitely a great way to get involved, but there's a whole range of things that we need. There's engineering, scientists, political science. It's a huge landscape of options. Bristol Community College, they've been a great partner in terms of making sure that we're ready for this huge industry that is such a once in a lifetime opportunity. Welcome representatives from Vineyard Wind. My title is the Chief Development Officer at Vineyard Wind. I have a team of about 30. It's a very different experience when we were just two or three of us. But as it grows, we bring in people who want to work hard, who are enthusiastic about our goals. Recently, we've had the most ultimate success, which is finally getting all of our approvals. But the underlying success has been building an enthusiastic and dedicated team. That team has grown up in about two years, so about as fast as offshore wind is growing. I think that's been our biggest success. My name is Amanda Shane. I am the U.S. Policy Specialist for Vestas Wind Systems America. I really enjoy my work. I monitor and advocate for clean energy legislation at state and federal levels. When I started college, I was an English major. I ended up taking an internship with a congressman's campaign. 
I really loved the impactfulness of politics. I got a perspective on policy making, speaking to people and hearing their day-to-day -day concerns. I got to learn how you bring different people to the table and how you get people of disparate backgrounds to find some common ground. I'm very, very fortunate that my journey gave me a passion for advocacy. I've been able to speak with people both at the highest echelons of our government, but I've also done community organizing. You have to meet people where they're at, and that means going out into communities where they're in their backyard, so to speak. We're currently at this pivotal moment where we can really create precise change. A lot of people talk about offshore wind in this really broad, non-specific way. The more we talk to people and the more information we provide that's not obtuse pie charts and graphs, that really makes a difference. I've had the opportunity to go to some of our factories overseas, and the people who are working in those factories, they used to be house painters or dog walkers or babysitters. They were in areas where the old jobs dried up. They didn't want to leave their homes. And so the exciting thing about the National Offshore Wind Institute here at Bristol Community College is it's showcasing a pathway forward where you can stay in the community that you love and build a great life for yourself there. Vestas has a graduate program. Students from all over the world come and do shifts in different departments. They're enthusiastic. They bring great new ideas to it, but also we're showing them different pathways. Regardless of you know, your major or your interests or where your passions lie, there is a spot for you. There are definitely times where I have been the only woman in the room. You have to fight to be heard. It still happens. But I think it's so important that we just continue to show up. You also have to remember that there are things you know and a perspective that you bring. To the credit of my male colleagues, I don't think I have ever been silenced or diminished. People I work with on a day-to-day -day basis, they always really value those perspectives. It's just so good to have people that you can turn to, and especially women when you are a woman, to know that you're not alone in this, that there are other people that share your enthusiasm. If we want to build an inclusive industry, then we need to reach out to all candidates, and we're building it right here in New England. I've been to Denmark and walked down the plants to see the blades being made. It's so incredible to stand next to a turbine. It's not even mounted on the tower yet. And you just feel so small, but also that you're part of something that's so great. Just seeing the forward momentum that we're making, it's an incredible moment in history. Now I would like to introduce Jennifer Menard, the Vice President of Economic and Business Development. Jennifer has been instrumental in the creation of NAWI and will guide you through today's series. Thank you, President Douglas, and to the participants here today from across the globe to be a part of the first National Offshore Wind Institute's speaker series, Equity in Offshore Wind. Thank you very much to Sec Secretary Theoretes for her comprehensive update on the status and future of the sector in Massachusetts. And many thanks to today's sponsors who made this event possible, Lockheed Martin, Burns and McDonnell, and the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. As you saw from the video, each panelist had a unique, and perspective, a unique perspective and story of their personal and professional journey. Today, I'm excited to moderate a panel discussion with these distinguished leaders that focuses on current opportunities and challenges for this emerging industry in the United States. Let's start this exciting discussion. Good morning, panelists. I'm gonna just start with the first question. As we all know, the offshore wind industry has dealt with some hurdles that led to delays in the timing of the first offshore wind project. Could you speak about the unexpected opportunities or things that you learned during this period of time? Hi everyone, uh, this is Rachel Pactor. I think I'll, I'll jump in on that one with Vineyard Wind. Um, we've had obviously, as we, talk in the, we talked about in the videos, delays for much more than just the Vineyard Wind project. 
we've obviously had a long time to mature uh, the technology and, along the way, obviously with, with the folks at Siemens, Vestas and GE, they've been outpacing us with their turbines and we can't get as many of them installed in the US or we're, we're working on it. So uh, for the Vineyard Wind One project, we did see a, a two year delay from the federal government. Um, for us, that time was used for um, more community engagement. I think there's really, you can't really have enough of that. We have a lot of stakeholders that are very engaged in these projects. Um, so uh, we, and I can obviously talk more about that. I think specifically we were able to actually align the project layouts with our neighboring projects. So in the case of Vineyard Wind and, and also Mayflower, there's a unique situation where you have several lease areas all adjacent to each other. So things like navigation um, all need to be addressed together in terms of you know other impacts too are addressed um, kind of kind of together. So we were able to align the layouts, the turbine placements, um, and I think we were actually able to use a newer generation of wind turbine, and thereby making the footprint of the project smaller. Um, which I think you know again sort of we're get as we're getting into this in the U.S. One of the things we feel strongly about is that we learn as much as possible from this first project and sort of be able to share that with projects going forward so we can kind of shorten the review time and get more comfortable with what the risks are and what they aren't. Um, and so people can just kind of get up and running with, with, this, with this, you know, huge climate change mitigation option. Hi, this is Amanda from uh, Vestas. I'll jump in as as well. You know, nobody likes to see delays in projects, right? It, it was a huge setback for the whole industry, not just any single project. Um, but at the same point, the U.S. is trying to do in the next 10 years what it's taken Europe about 30 years to accomplish, which is this massive deployment of offshore wind at a scale that uh, we just haven't seen previously in this country. And so one thing that a little bit of time allows us to do is, is try and get things like the supply chain up and running, like technicians trained, um, just try and get everything established because we're already seeing that there's some enormous challenges for this industry, whether you're looking at transportation or you're looking at timelines to get workers certified. So a little bit more time is, a, is an opportunity, I think, to get more Americans trained and prepared for this industry. Yeah, and to add to what Amanda said, this is Cynthia from Siemens Gamesa. Um, another thing the time allowed us to do was to bring in some of the technology advancements, um, especially in regards to training. So we're now looking at including virtual reality training, um, and it gave us time to actually develop that based on some of the partnerships we have um, within some of the community colleges, as well as uh, organizations, especially in the Massachusetts area. Um, it also gave us time to look at some of the skills gaps that are in the area and start helping to address those early on so that we will be ready from a workforce development standpoint. Wonderful. Any other panels that want to jump in? Yeah, this is Beth. Um, when you were when you were sharing what you what you learned and what that opportunity afforded, it reminded me of something I had the opportunity to hear not too long ago about somebody who climbed Everest. And one of the things I didn't know is how often you go backwards as you climb. So you make it to one camp, you stay there for a little bit, you go back down. And so it was really a kind of a mind perspective shift of backing up is not backing down. And I think when we think about this massive task of building offshore in the US, I think of it kind of like climbing Everest where we might have to back up a little bit and take that time so we can keep moving forward. So your, your answers reminded me of that. So I just thought I'd share. Okay, great. So each of your organizations are extremely dedicated to the US infrastructure, supply chain and work development, as you just noted. With that in mind, can you describe how your organization demonstrates its commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion? Obviously, many of you noted it in the, in the video if you want to speak to it specifically here. Sure, I'll um, start off again, Cynthia from Siemens Gamesa. Um, so one of the things that we've done is roll out what we call future generations by Siemens Gamesa. And we've kind of broken it into different phases. So starting with the K through 12 um, STEM focus, where we're partnering with another Siemens entity to kind of build upon the STEM ecosystem that they've already been building in some of the communities. Um, we also do tours at our um, training facility here in Orlando for elementary and middle school students. We actually partner with GE and some of the other energy companies that are here local 
um, and provide summer tours. So last couple of years, unfortunately, we haven't had been able to do them, um, but looking forward to getting those started again, where we have 60 to 80 students per summer just come and see a nacelle, right? Especially here in the Southeast where we don't have large nacelles in wind. So that's really exciting to get them excited and interested in the field. Um, we've also launched our Wind Academy by Siemens Gamesa, which is more of a vocational program. Um, for those who choose not the traditional maybe college route, it's a three-week program to help get them started in the wind industry. Um, we have partnerships, so many of the uh, panelists talked about partnerships with local community colleges and high schools um, with the recruiting and internships. We also have a rotational development program, which is really great because it's early um, entry level employees get the opportunity to move across three to four different departments early in their career before they kind of maybe decide where they want to work. Um, so those are a few things that we're doing from an external standpoint. Yeah, and I'll also add to that, I think there is a lot of work that we've been engaged with, and I think most of our companies have um, in partnership with state agencies to map supply chains, identify existing minority-owned, women-owned, veteran-owned businesses, and see how we can help support their entrance into the offshore wind industry. Because, you know, especially if you look at New England, where offshore wind is sort of taking root, we have a huge manufacturing ecosystem here, and many of these businesses are owned by women or are owned by minorities or veterans. And so we wanna make sure that those businesses in particular have access to the resources and training, um, whether it's GWAC or through NAWI or, or otherwise, um, to be part of this industry. You know, perhaps there are you know, man manufacturers out there who are making subcomponents and could make things for the offshore wind industry. And so that's a huge part, I think, of the work that needs to be do done, making sure that people and existing businesses aren't left behind. Any other panelists want to jump in on the, um, just making sure everybody's okay? Yeah, this is Rachel. I can say okay. a little bit more too, and just noting that, you know, Vineyard Wind, uh, like Mayflower, is also a joint venture. So we have two bigger parent companies, uh, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners and Avant Grid Renewables. And they, they saw, you know, they as independent entities have their own programs. Vineyard Wind, as a JV, has an opportunity to kind of mold our own and so we are we're kind of doing that and I think we're looking at a lot of the things that that were already mentioned like the supply chain so how are we addressing both our internal um, employment but also you know the money we're spending because the majority of it the majority of jobs we build are not within the company they're external to Vineyard Wind as a developer so how do we encourage through that piece um, I think the secretary talked about our project labor agreement which has um, significant commitments, um, although we do see that as a floor to keep moving you know, forward from um, as the workforce gets built up here. Uh, we have, you know, as I mentioned in the video, we have an internship program, um, but we're also looking at ways to get into the younger ages as well. Um, so we're engaging with the, the younger schools so that people particularly were very active in the New Bedford area. So you know, how do we get kids thinking about it younger, get their, you know, families more comfortable with this as a career path and, and that sort of communication. So I think that one at this stage is a lot of listening too. I think for us, there's a lot of listening involved um, in figuring this out because we're finding that, um, you know, it's definitely one of those that really requires, you know, moving mountains um, internally because there's just the challenges exist, have existed for a long time. So we're we're moving some heavy things, um, and we're also being we're also being pushed on ex this externally, so where we're submitting into RFPs and things like that. So, and that's that's helpful in the sense that it allows us to kind of push our suppliers, um, several of which are on this meeting, but and uh, you know their sub suppliers to keep pushing those those goals. So it's kind of all of those come together when it comes to development. Yeah, and just to second that, you know, being a joint venture with the two parent companies, we can all, Shell, Ocean Winds, and Mayflower can all work together to sort of promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in sort of our own ways. I um, mean, one thing that I was surprised to find, and this was with COVID, um, we, Ocean Winds at least, um, you know, we used online platforms to communicate much more often. And I found that um, people were talking more about diversity, equity, and inclusion on those platforms um, and just really encouraging discussion so just internally, people were thinking about it a lot more, whether you were working with, you know, recruitment or not. Um, so just, I was very impressed by how all of our companies were able to sort of promote those discussions, even when we weren't all working right next to each other. And I'll just say one, one last thing. It relates to what Julia um, was saying. 
I'm I'm really excited that we have this time to be really thoughtful and deliberate around diversity and equality and inclusion. And it just makes me extra excited that we're having this conversation with this group of people. I think that's a, a great, a great sign. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just echo that. I mean, I think this is a chance. We have a chance here to build an industry the right way. Um, you know, there is one thing about getting an industry off the ground in this time and in this era. You're absolutely right, Beth. I've heard so many conversations um, about this. It really seems to be top of mind for for much of the industry, um, and so that's hugely encouraging because not everyone gets to start at this point of let's make this a focus and let's make sure that we get this this off the ground in the right way and include as many people as we can and, and make sure that we're thoughtful in citing that we're thoughtful in recruitment yeah and i know we've talked a lot about externally and i mentioned a lot of what we're doing externally internally i think with the targets and um say initiatives right that have kind of been flowing down it's also changed the company's perspective or just brought it to the more forefront. So we have our own internal diversity, equity, and inclusion council. I know most of the companies, you know, have different councils or something similar. Um, it's also driven global initiatives to increase the workforce, especially women in senior management positions. So it's really nice to see, you know, internally the company own these initiatives that are being excellent and also driven. Thank you, that's a great point. And I, I continue to hear that it's more at the forefront as we continue to talk. And um, I, I did get very excited to see in the videos that each one of you uh, talked about sort of what those, those internal groups meant. Um, and I know a number of you said within your organization, there's a number of groups, mentoring groups and support groups with, that support many different groups of people. So I think that's really exciting. Um, is it okay for me to jump to the next question? I know that I could talk about that for another uh, another hour. As the um, as the offshore wind industry has cleared major hurdles and moved forward in the last few months, can you describe your company's workforce recruitment plans or your expect expectations for employment pipelines for different occupations within this industry? Not an easy uh, an easy question, but I hope each one of you will will take it on. Yeah, I can start with this one. So as, as I mentioned, Mayflower is backed by two sponsor companies, um, Shell and Ocean Winds. So this allows us to leverage their global experience um, in both offshore conventional energy and offshore and onshore renewable energy. Um, but at the same time, Mayflower is committed to building a local workforce through economic development and community-based support efforts. Um, so at least 75% of our operations and maintenance jobs will be locally based. Um, and Mayflower is working with local educational and training institutions like NAWI um, and Bristol Community College in order to build up the workforce that that'll be needed to bring clean renewable energy to shore. Um, the different opportunities and needs of our project will drive engagement with vocational high schools, uh, community colleges, maritime educational and training institutions like Mass Maritime, um, higher education institutions like UMass Dartmouth, UMass Lowell, and UMass Amherst, um, as well as local private institutions. And I think that Mayflower's strength comes from combining the experience of some of our European colleagues uh, with the local workforce that brings with it regional knowledge, as well as um, a passion for bringing power to our own homes and communities. And yeah, and I'll just add to that, um, you know, at Festus, we are already hiring um, actively. So I encourage anybody who's interested in, in learning more about some of those positions to uh, take a look online at, at our website. But also, this is uh, a long-term process. And so there's going to be a lot of jobs available at a variety of different levels, you know, whether it is uh, college education or if you're going through a non-traditional, you know, more STEM technical training path, um, you know, if you're looking at manufacturing or also at service technicians. I mean, this industry is huge and there's a lot of different positions that are going to be available, not just now, but, but in the future. And I'll just share something that recently impacted me as I have a position that I'm trying to fill. So um, our HR team has just recently released a gender neutral um, coding device to us. And the idea is that sometimes when we create job descriptions, the terminology or vocabulary that we use may dominate towards males or females, and it's a matter of how the words are actually perceived. 
and it can actually impact people even deciding if they want to apply for a job or thinking if they're qualified for a job. And so I used that tool on a recent job description and found like I had six or seven male job dominated type words. So I actually had to adjust and it's like, okay, what are the neutral words that I can use to describe the same thing? So I think sometimes it's the little things that can also help move us in the right direction to make sure we're getting a diverse set of candidates to even choose you know, and select from and make sure everyone has an equal opportunity. I, this is Rachel, I'll jump in. I, I think you know, I'll echo uh, a fair amount of Julia's comments as far as the local hiring and the local engagement and obviously kind of empowering new, newer local hires so that they're good ambassadors for us and, and getting people excited. Um, but I, I guess maybe a missing link and maybe this is something for Nawi and others to continue thinking about is how do we kind of consolidate all of these jobs into, because it's not just the developer and it's not just the wind turbine manufacturer, right? It's the environmental consultants and the scientists and the lawyers. And you know, when we're talking to an audience like this and the college audience, you know, I don't want, um, and I think in particular developers get a lot of the focus in terms of like, I wanna work with that developer. It's like, that might not be the best fit for you in the sense that like, if you wanna be a scientist, we have a lot of jobs for scientists. Most of those are with consultants. You know the engineering you know better to maybe go with the turbine manufacturer but it's still getting into offshore wind so maybe as a group we can do a good job a better job of communicating all of that consolidating that somehow and then of course you know adding in the the diversity and equity piece in terms of how we're getting it out into the the world in terms of getting the applications in but i think sort of thinking about how we can best communicate the variety of opportunities and the players who are giving those opportunities. I think in addition to, I think Amanda, I don't know if it was this question or the previous question where you're identifying all the suppliers who, you know, might be like adjacent to what we're doing and have not even thought about, you know, wait, I could do offshore wind. And it's like, yeah, if you just tweak this in your factory. And, you know, so there's a lot there, I think there's a fruitful area there, but I think there might be an opening for more organizing of getting that information for the, the newcomers to the industry. Um, I, I love that. And I, I think for us from the National Offshore Wind Institute, this is exactly what we'd love to work on with each one of you about looking at pathways and how we can make sure that everyone's aware of the pathways, whether it's educational or career pathways into this industry, of course, with a focus on DEI, but also just in terms of the, the, the diverse need. Uh, Cynthia, I'm absolutely wowed by your, your device. I think we need to know what that is and we'll have to take a look because I think all of us are striving to remove those kinds of words, especially when you're doing it and saying, this document's fine, you do it, and you find that you actually have done what you didn't realize, right? Words in there that may make somebody feel like it's not for them, right? That's not what we're looking to do. So wonderful. Um, anything more on that? I'm gonna go to the next question. We've all been through dramatic changes professionally and personally due to the pandemic. It's a little bit different. It's more about each one of you including the ways that we do business, conduct trainings, and even meet with colleagues. Can you describe the technologies or innovations that will remain in your work or organization? I can give you one very simple one that I'm excited to have continue. So I'm part of the GE's African American Forum and we all went remote and so we don't see each other more anymore. So what we did is we set up a virtual coffee meeting Right, so it's just if you you can opt in, but it's essentially just on your calendar, like a Teams meeting. And anytime you have a free minute, pop into the virtual coffee room, and you know everybody will get a little no notification that someone's in the meeting. If you have time, you can go in and just spend five minutes, three minutes, and just connect with somebody that you normally would have bumped into in the hallway, um, or even some folks that you would only see like once a year at a conference. It's just a different way to stay connected. That if you can't join, don't join. You can, great. Um, so I'm I'm glad we're gonna we're gonna keep that going. Yeah, and we had something pretty similar actually um, at the beginning of COVID. So I actually joined Mayflower at the beginning of COVID, and I hadn't met any of my coworkers for the first like five months. Um, and so at that time, everyone was adjusting to being remote. And so we used to have calls every single morning to check in just for like. 10, 15 minutes. And the project was also a lot smaller back then. Um, so a bunch of people would join the call. We'd all just talk about, you know, work-related things or non-work-related things. And I 
first I was able to, you know, recognize everybody's names. And so that was really helpful. And then I was able to actually, you know, learn a little bit about each person. And so even though I hadn't met any of my colleagues, I felt like I knew them. Um, and that was so important for me integrating into Mayflower and, and then ultimately feeling, you know, comfortable with the team and expressing my ideas pretty early on because um, I felt like I knew everyone. Um, you know, now we've toned it down so it's not every single day, but, but we do check in, you know, two or three times a week as a team. Um, and it is, it's really helpful. It's been, it's been, it's allowed all the newcomers to kind of get to know each other. Um, and it's allowed the team to just function a lot better. And so moving back into the office, we'll see how, you know, if that turns into something that's in person or um, sort of a hybrid remote um, in-person check-in, but that has been um, really helpful for Mayflower. Yeah, I'd say if there's one thing that um, the pandemic has probably taught all of us, it's those informal connections, like those informal meeting times that matter so much more than like the actual structured meetings. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I think all of us probably have found different ways. I know we have at Vestas as well, whether you're having um, sort of a just a team lunch or check in. I mean, we've, we've tried really hard to, to have these spaces where you're not just talking about work all the time, but you're relating to each other on a personal level, because that's what's really easy to miss when you're just all remote is um, any of those chances to just get to know folks as individuals and as human beings. Um, so I think that's that's one thing that we've really worked hard on here. And I think that's definitely going to stay, especially for a global company like ours, where your colleagues might be overseas or they might be on the West Coast. Um, you know, it's, it's so important to have those times to, to just check in, touch base. Um, yeah, I'll just add a couple of points, which is, you know, I think um, we, uh, not unlike again, Julia, we have grown a lot. Um, in fact, we're, we're finding that trying to bring people back into the office is a problem because we actually don't have enough space for all the people that we hired um, during the pandemic. So I'm sure they can join a special club of like, I got hired during the pandemic um, support group, but I think we're, it's, we're helping to um, make our onboarding a little bit more efficient because we're realizing that you can record a lot of this. And so if people are busy and they don't have enough time to spend with a new hire, they've got some things they can use. And we've done, you know, individual, uh, we do something where people can kind of give their own mentoring story, like what's my professional story? And the, the new hires have an opportunity to, and our interns can log into there and in their, you know, available time when when they can't reach anyone or they're just interested. So we've, we've been able to kind of build up our, um, you know, our sort of online resources for people around the company, which was a, a novel thought, um, I think. And then we also did some things that we could have been doing before, but, you know, weren't necessarily doing, like we initially, immediately we started a fitness challenge and we did the same thing where they sort of forced the groups to, so we had like groups against each other and it was forced groups to that, are, that weren't the same people that you work with every day um, to kind of help us. So we definitely, I definitely saw broader range of people and personalities. And obviously you're also seeing certain people um, engage more through different forums, whether it's the, the online chatting that we're doing now more or the, you know, or, or Zoom for some reason, some people talk a little bit more in those meetings. So um, it'll be a hybrid because there's definitely challenges and I don't think we can keep the Zoom the whole time because you do need those smaller conversations to move more efficiently, but. Um, but I think some of those will definitely keep. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, the last question, what would your advice be to a graduating high school senior on their next steps if they would like to enter the offshore wind workforce or work for your company? Okay, so I have, I have some advice. I'm going to give three pieces because sometimes you hear something and it just doesn't fit for the moment you're in. So I'm going to go with the first one. I don't know if anybody remembers the magic school bus and Miss Frizzle, but this is one of her catchphrases and it's um, take chances, make mistakes, get messy. I'm just gonna leave that there. Um, the other one goes along with what I said in the, my video of, and I think of what, maybe even what Cynthia, what you're, you were talking a little bit about in your job description, don't select yourself out of the running because you think maybe you don't have this one skill or that skill. I would say focus on what makes you uniquely you and, and go, go with that. 
And then the last piece of advice, or this is from Ava DuVernay, is if your dream only includes you, it's too small. And so, right, that might not be, you might not be ready for that right now, but, you know, hold it in the back of your mind as you continue to evolve and grow in your career. Did, did the three put all of you guys off? Any other advice for high school seniors? <laughs> I think really, I think it's, got, uh, <laughs> sorry, you go ahead, Amanda. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I think, um, you know, don't don't think that you know exactly what this industry is. This is an industry that's really growing and getting on its feet right now. And there's a lot of pathways uh, into it. You know, I was not a science or STEM person. Um, several of the folks on this this call are. Um, I numbers were never my my strong suit. But if you have a passion for you know climate change or this industry, you know there are still plenty of different ways to to find an entrance into it. Um, you know, there's just so many types of jobs and positions that are available. So if this interests you, but you think, oh, maybe I'm not technically minded or, um, or if you are technically minded, yeah, there's, there's multiple different pathways to find success here um, and to find a position that would fit you and let you do something that you're interested in and, and passionate about. So don't, don't be afraid to take a, take a shot or do some research or contact our companies and see you know, what pathways and what sorts of jobs might be available. Because I think we're all a lot more diverse um, and have a lot more positions than you would necessarily think just from looking at the, the boilerplates. Um, and I guess my piece of advice, and Rachel and Bethany, I think both um, address this in their videos, but my advice would just be to reach out to people. Um, because I remember when I wanted to get into offshore wind, I felt really overwhelmed. Like I didn't, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything about it. I felt like I didn't know enough to get into the industry. But right when I started meeting people who were in it, suddenly it became a lot more, um, just feasible for me to, you know, apply for jobs or um, just envision myself in a job in offshore wind. Um, so yeah, like reach out on LinkedIn, um, reach out to me, anybody really, I'm sure they'd be happy to, to talk to you. I think it seems like, you know, when you're in high school, you think, oh, these professionals, they're so, um, they're so much older than me, they're not going to give me the time of day. But that's usually not the case. Usually people are very, very excited to talk to you about what they do um, and sort of answer any of your questions. So you might as well just go for it because the worst that can happen is they don't respond to you. Um, but the best case scenario is that, you know, you make a new friend, you learn a little bit about an interest industry you're in interested in. Um, so you might as well just give it a try. Okay, a couple more thoughts. Um... I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go with the theme of threes, but nowhere near as good. I will, I will say that it's hard to follow Bethany's threes, but um, you know, always pay attention to learning moments. So take from that meeting, what is the thing you didn't previously know? And don't, you know, to be as, limit your defensiveness as much as possible in terms of what you do and don't know and, and absorb as much as you possibly can and say, okay, this is, I know all this. I didn't know this. Let me learn more about it. And also follow up with a person if, you know, if they're willing to spend the time and you want to know more about it, you know, catch them, find them, you know, see if you can meet them in the cafeteria. Um, also, it's hard um, to build your career. So don't get discouraged. And it's not usually a straight path. So just noting, like reminding folks that like, if it feels bad at any point, I mean, you know, it's just, it's, it's a hard thing to do. It's not, nobody's, you know, the, the days I think of like, these are the stepwise approaches. And if you stay here, we're gonna move you up this ladder, um, don't exist. Um, and obviously they're harder for women and they're harder for a more diverse um, group. So it gets even harder on that front. So I just, you know, be aware that it's not hard just for you, it's hard for everyone to do. Um, and so learn from other people. I think the third one is also, you know, make sure that you have a good balance with your, your work life and your home life. Um, because that will keep you sustainable for a long, uh, a long career that you can love uh, by making sure that that it's not it's not everything. You know, it's it's a big part of it and it's exciting, um, but make sure you put the time in on your personal side too. And I agree with everyone. Everyone, everything everyone said. I just say real quick, just be open. Um, where you start your career likely is not where you're going to finish it. So just keep in mind that, you know, you might be looking at this one particular job or think I'm super interested in that, like I was at one point in time. And then, you know, five, 10 years 
you might be doing something totally different you never thought about. So just be open um, and along with everything everyone else said, it's just an exciting time. Um, jump in, just don't, don't hesitate. Well, I love that as the ending uh, for today. Um, thank you so much to Rachel, Cynthia, Julia, Amanda and Bethany for this amazing panel discussion, as well as your support of the National Offshore Wind Speaker Series. We learned so much from these women on their pathways to their current roles and ways for others to follow in their footsteps. The NAWI will continue to focus on these important issues around offshore wind and an essential emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you so much for those who turned in today. Don't miss the NAWI's orientation for offshore wind coming up next week. For more information, go to NAWI.org. And again, I wanna thank our sponsors for your dedication and support to our work. Lockheed Martin, Burns and McDonnell, and the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. And now I will turn it back to President Douglas. Thank you for being with us today to hear about the current status of the industry and to learn from these five amazing accomplished women in offshore wind. Thank you and have a great day. <laughs>